So, we're back. <laughs> Long time no see. Hope, uh, hopefully you enjoyed the lunch. I'm looking forward to trying some myself. But um, while you dine, uh, we have Andrew West over here, who is a PhD student at the Graduate School of Education. He's done a lot of good research and uh, hard work with us this year in, in bringing his teaching expertise and uh, background in uh, dealing with difficult moments in the classroom to consultations with faculty around uh, the university. And uh, he's put together a really, really good and good looking uh, uh, <laughs> workshop for us to dive into today. Um, and so we're looking forward to your participation. And Andrew, it's on you. Thank you so much, Michael. Um, and thank you to all of you for being here. I know that it's wild to come in the middle of a Thursday over to the <laughs> heights of the Kennedy School. We really appreciate it. Thank you to Safra for sponsoring this work. Um, and I look forward to our conversation today. So today we are talking about teaching in difficult moments. Um, just as a quick overview, let me see if this little clicker will work. Looks like that might not be set up, so I'll do it here. Um, Today we are going to be looking at a couple of things. First, we're going to be thinking about what are difficult moments in teaching? What do I mean when I'm saying that? Then we're going to consider a couple of different possible responses to these difficult moments. We're then going to analyze a couple of case studies and finally apply this, all of this, ideally, to our own contexts. So just so I can get a sense of who's in the room, um, can you raise your hand if you are currently teaching or Yes, you can. Which mic would you so like? This one. This one. Yes. I am currently double mic. Double mic. I don't know why, but oh, that would be why. <laughs> there we go. Um, so if I could get a sense of who's in the room. So if you could raise your hand if you are currently in a teaching capacity, directly teaching a course or some, okay, wonderful. If you could raise your hand if you are currently supporting teachers in some regard. Fantastic. Great. And then for the folks who haven't yet raised their hand, well, I know your connections. You're confused. What do TFs count as? That's a very good question. And maybe a good question for the university to answer. Um, we'll, we'll skip that for the moment, but thank you for raising that. Um, <laughs> And then, yeah. did you say you are currently teaching? Or no, you're... I'm currently doing research, but I will be supporting future teaching as of fall. Wonderful, great, thanks. That helps me get a sense of who's in the room. In that case, hopefully this will be helpful for almost everyone here. Um, okay, so what am I talking about difficult moments? What does this even mean? Difficult moments can show up in a variety of ways. In general, these are things that happen from a teacher perspective that aren't necessarily what you desire sometimes. So sometimes this can come up with the course content. The way people respond to course content, the course content itself can prove difficult for students or teachers. Other times it can be when current events intersect with the course content in difficult ways. Um, or it might intersect with the lives of people in the classroom. You may have heard about this happening on campus when people feel that their particular identities are not being well reflected or being reflected incorrectly or in harmful ways. Another might be uneasy realities related to a discipline. What are the assumptions of a discipline? What are the methodologies of a discipline? What do they prioritize? What do they not? And how do students respond to these things? They also be related to interpersonal conflict that could happen anywhere. It's just these particular people are in this particular space, and it's not necessarily going well or it might be a hot moment for any of a myriad of other reasons. This is sort of the constellation that I'm gonna ask you to, to think about in your mind as we're, as we're moving into this space. People respond to difficult moments in many ways. The next slide shows a broad overview based on some individual um, interviews with teachers from across Harvard schools about how they respond to difficult moments. Avoidance came up very regularly, often paired with silence or internalization. So this is a time when something doesn't necessarily need, according to the person who's leading the space, an immediate response. You'll often see something like moving on, avoiding entirely. The second set is the one we see more often in the Crimson, 
this would be if something is misinterpreted or if an attack happens in the learning space. The third would arguably be the most common for students, which would be confusion. There's recognition that there's something that's difficult, but there's not a lot of clarity about either what it is or how to move forward. The fourth, not particularly easy, but happens in some spaces more than others. In my very, frankly, <laughs> unrigorous interviewing, <laughs> where, let me, let me actually do a sidebar here. This interviewing was me talking to people who I know have had difficult moments, <laughs> and also me trying to get folks from every Harvard school. By the way, the dental school is very small. <laughs> um, so this is not representative of the dental school. Um, but <laughs> uh, this fourth one, the naming and confronting. This, I think, was interesting because it came up more often in the professional schools than anywhere else. There was a sense that because students were going on to be in spaces with people who they would have to have interpersonal relationships with quite quickly, there was a stronger sense of responsibility for many of these instructors that difficult moments needed to be named explicitly. Um, and then the last, this, I know this is sort of a funny pairing, surprise and discretion. Um, this is what I've lumped as the folks who were not anticipating the difficult moment, were generally folks who had a reasonable level of social skills and tried to figure out socially acceptable ways to respond in the moment to these difficult things and they usually showed up as one or the other of these. Either acknowledging, wow, that was not what I expected. All right, I guess we will dive right into that. So an acknowledgement of something being different, or a really incredible, in some cases, demonstration of discrete response. Isolating in their mind, who is the person for whom this is particularly difficult? Is there a way I can redirect the entire class to have an individual conversation? Are there ways I can have interactions or engagements outside of the course? So this is the landscape that I think we're currently living in at Harvard with regard to identifying a difficult moment and then trying to respond. Okay, so I do these interviews, I think about these things, and one of the biggest things I realize is that there's not a strong sense of how systematically we can consider these difficult moments and what might be useful frames for trying to think about them before they happen. Some of you may know I also do a little bit of work with the Box Center. Um, thank you, Box Center, for your support. Um, and this is in part from work that was piloted there and now is being bridged over through the SAFRA work as well. These are opportunities for engaging difficult moments. Divided it into three sections. The first, looking at the classroom ecosystem intentionally cultivating pedagogical environments that foster productive conversation. You'll note that for the most part, this is geared more towards the humanities simply because that's where I reside. However, I do not think this is exclusively for folks working in the humanities. Um, and we'll have some examples coming up that I think will help, help show that. The second bit, even in the most perfect classroom ecosystem, you will probably have difficult moments. How can we identify those? How can we identify those discreetly clearly, and to the best ends. And then, once we've identified, what do we do? What do we do in the moment? What do we do after the moment? Are ongoing check-ins necessary? How can we frame this such that the, the learning space is as healthy and strong as possible? I, I'm now gonna go through each of these, and I'm gonna ask you to be talking at your tables. So if you are currently at a table of one, that's gonna make it a little bit tricky. So I'm gonna ask you to please migrate, if you don't mind, to a table with more than one. Um, and with each of these, I'd like you to simply discuss the questions on the board as they relate to how you've thought about your own teaching practice or the teaching practice of people you have supported. So in this first one, we have a series of questions around building the classroom environment. So I'd like you to think about have you asked these questions about your own environment first? And then, how might these questions show up in your support for teachers if you're primarily operating in a support role? Right. You'll have approximately uh, three to four minutes for each of these three segments. Please begin. No, sorry, three to four minutes for this slide. This slide, thank you. Yeah, I'm so 
I think that got through both the briefs. Okay. A while. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> it uh, philosophy. Uh, oh. Yeah. Yeah. I, I kind of, that's it, the initial proposal was more philosophy of science, but um, taking a more holistic look at this. So what I ended up doing was asking students to curate uh, all of their desks so that we would like So, um, so I, I don't know it's, it's, like it's like difficult like to talk about it because we have a class of very different scientists and we don't have, uh, we have very little teaching space ourselves so often our class is kept distributed around the campus into all sorts of other buildings and then what you find there is, is can be very very different so I've taught software engineering I've taught in a tiered lecture theatre I've taught in an environment almost like this a little bit bigger to accommodate the numbers but um, there I could have done something last time I taught it was in so one uh, teaching room that we do have, which is a, a divided room. You know, it's got an A and B section. So it's got a divider, like I guess this, um, which works so so that if you have a single person speaking, the colleague has a very loud voice. When he's teaching next door, you need to raise yours. And then you, you essentially get a shouting noise. Sometimes the dividers are not put in properly, and then you have a real problem. So that limits. Right. So I realize you've only just yeah. begun speaking, but if you, oh, wow, everyone got silent immediately. We are with working <laughs> professionals here. <laughs> um, I know that each of these slides you could talk about for probably at least an hour. My goal in these conversations is just to begin to get those juices flowing. We are going to go ahead now and move to the next slide, but I'd like you to try as much as you can to hold these conversations with you as we move forward, because each of these are going to play into how we consider the tactics that will come next. So the next bit, we've got now in our mind a vague sense, hopefully, of a classroom setting or multiple classroom settings. And now, how do we identify difficult moments in teaching? Where is the difficulty located? How can it be identified? Who else notices, if anyone? How are they interpreting what you're interpreting as a difficult moment? What responses, intellectual, emotional, physical, are you having? And what responses, if any, are students having? So in order to discuss this, I would recommend perhaps you deputize one person to think about a particular difficult moment and then walk through that difficult moment using these questions. All right, please begin. Uh, which this was an undergraduate that I was teaching when they passed. 
And so, you know, if our undergraduates are very wide-ranging degrees of higher knowledge, and have one student who didn't have that much prior knowledge, or sort of very small bits and pieces, and had a tendency to ask lots of questions that uh, showed that he knew something, yeah. got some yeah. other yeah. things fundamentally yeah. wrong yeah. in ways that weren't interesting for most of the class. And he, he, would, he would be a quite frequent. Uh, I want students to frequent flyers. So I wanted students, well, I want students to but maybe him a little bit less, or maybe come and visit me. You know. I, I think I did do the end, yeah. uh, and then, like, it, it just the first day <laughs> where I observed that, yeah, 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 when it was the second day when I saw, it. okay, uh, that's what we like with from now on. I said, you know, come and have a chat. So I think I was a bit more patient with the student and I was trying to explain um, on the assumption that maybe if they found it misunderstood something, others might as well and um, that, yeah, I would help them by explaining it again. Um, but I could, you know, by and over time I could see an increasing number of students roll their eyes um, when we had another other question from them. Um, and you know, some people more than, than others. Um, you know, some people more sort of. I mean, they were all facing me because this was a, a tiered lecture theatre, so I could see their reaction. But they they were sitting at the back, and um, uh, you know, some of the reactions were quite sort of. What, what an idiot is that? You know, they weren't just sort of annoyance at the, the time that was taken, but but really kind of. Yeah. And they should know better than this. Yeah. Um, the other aspect also was that uh, I was recording the, the lectures. Not a video recording, but uh, just the slides that I was presenting in audio. Um, and one thing, I don't know if I should jump to that, but very quickly, I cut some of, his, some of the questions out in the recording. I edited, that, that was one of the few instances where I edited the, the recording. Because we ended up in a 10 minute discussion about something that wasn't very limited. I think I think I said that you know you can come to the so you can sleep with they, they can come to me and uh, you know I can spend some time after class clarifying my points and maybe we should jot down the questions um, and use the opportunity yeah. afterwards. Because um, not very well because I would have remembered that. Right. I, I and think if you could begin finishing that last set of thoughts um, that were you know, disrupting the flow. Um, I think I think they came to me to my office once or twice to ask some more questions. And I, I tried to help. So it kind of right. um, I know it can be hard when you're, particularly in a case that you're personally invested in, to be like, wait, I have to cut it off. I was just getting to the beginning of it. I promise you will get more time momentarily because many of you are already moving on to the next slide, which is enacting the appropriate response. So once it has been identified as a difficult moment, does it need a response first? 
If so, does it need an immediate response or a longer term response or both or something else? In the moment, is digging deeper or moving on a better intermediate option? Or sorry, in immediate option. Is this a learning opportunity for the individual, for a group in the class, for the whole class, for yourself? Can you shift the terms of engagement to respond more productively? I'm going to clarify this final question because that may be, may be a bit unclear. There I'm thinking of, for example, if you, are, if you have a topic where someone may feel that they are personally attacked and most of the difficult moment has been framed in language of individual experience and their emotional response, is it possible to shift it so that it becomes an analytic conversation about what are these power structures that underlie what we're talking about? Or conversely, if you see someone who is getting very invested in interrogating, I don't know, neoliberal capitalism as an oppressive structure in your classroom, is it possible to shift to say, what does this mean for our human relations with one another? How is this showing up in our behaviors? So that's the sort of changing the mode, the terms of engagement that I'm, that I'm thinking of for that final question. But again, this time, you don't need to work your way through the questions. If any of them speak to you, great. If none of them speak to you, that's fine too. I'd just like you to think about what sorts of appropriate responses might be possible to the dilemma that you were already talking about in your table group. something like this in a technical field. Sometimes you just get from one you get from one misunderstanding to another. And you kind of you kind of really you, you stand there and you realize you might have to explain this as well. And so it's an un, becomes an unplanned part of the lecture. And I think you know maybe the best people can pull it off. But I couldn't wrap my head around it quickly enough to say, okay, you know, I need to know this, and this is how I'm going to explain it very quickly. <coughs> and maybe, you know, if, if, if you have similar questions with the same sort of general direction, then you can develop a pattern of how we're going to clarify this particular point. Um, I was kind of thinking, kind of looking forward to what we're going to do in the future. Um, so, you know, is it a good idea to say to the students up front, you know, I want discussion, okay. Then I encourage it, but if a question does not seem to benefit the class as a whole, I will move on from it, and that means you should come to me afterwards, so that your individual desire for learning is still met. Um, and that's why I have, well, we don't have literally open office doors because um, things are not too noisy, but um, you, know, you can knock any time and you know, expect um, to be met and either to arrange a meeting or you know, to, to have the questions answered right there. Um, what has been coming up for you guys? Whether with questions or with who everybody their time respect by that person being allowed to go on and it's not like 
I didn't allow it. I did it separately. Obviously, I told you that I I'm serving notice that if this happens, it's not personal to the university. It's a general. It's a bad thing. It's not a bad thing. Yeah. I mean, now that I think about it, yeah, I routinely get things working the other way around. But it's just almost too much. He wants to discuss things that go way beyond the content. And the funny thing is, right, in academia, we don't tend to get any training in teaching. You figure all of these things out after maybe nine years or so. Um, and hope to get better all the time. So, so that you yeah. Yeah. It's actually. Um, yeah. Right, but I'm sorry to interrupt again. You all are fantastic, also. <laughs> I'm listening to the conversations that are coming up, and I really appreciate that many of you, one, already are thinking about these things pretty rigorously, and two, are already thinking about what are ways outside of the bounds that we're currently operating? How can we be creative in responding to this? I think that's fantastic and precisely where we want to go with this. Um, so the next question is, well, what can we proactively do? What can we move forward with? And the goal of this presentation now is to offer you a set of eight things. These come literally from across uh, several domains, and um, thank you, Mike. Michael is very graciously going to pass out a series of papers. Um, if you would, please keep the photo side up for now. We'll turn it over in a minute. But for now, these, in case you want to take notes, I'm a note taker, so that's me giving you paper in case that's something you appreciate. If you don't want to take notes, feel free to not take notes. That is not required at all. But we're going to go through each of these eight. Some of them may be familiar to you. Um, some of them may be new to you. And then we're going to have a couple of cases where you can decide, are any of these appropriate? Is something else appropriate? How would we individually like, and collectively at the tables like to move forward? So here we go. The first is setting the tone. This is part of what that very first conversation was aimed towards. How are we setting the tone for the classroom, for the learning space? Here, I would encourage a couple of things. One, getting to know the students. Granted, if it's 160, you may not know all of their life stories, but having some sense of who's in the classroom, allowing them also to get to know you, this is something that I think people have lots of different ideas about, and this is something where I think having a sense of your own pedagogical style and your own ethical framework is really important. So there's a bit of self-work that's required, I think, before any of these are really able to be enacted. Um, allowing them to get to know you also allows you to build rapport among the group, to be explicit about your methods for the teaching and for the discipline, and to be mindful of what your language is. I see this most commonly when there are coming up in terms of difficult moments in the sciences, particularly at seas, where there are folks who, in their social lives or in their political lives, they identify as particularly progressive, for example. But then when they enter their scientific domain, it's almost as though there's an entirely different language that is paralleled with an entirely different value set. And there's not much acknowledgment of the fact that the language that's used in the private life doesn't necessarily match the language that's used in the teaching space. And that, that, that difference impacts the student's reception of the ideas. So a small thing, but one that I'd like us to think about as we're thinking about setting the tone. The second one I love, and I find that it's often rarely incorporated in these practices. Some of you know that I um, am currently working as a teaching assistant for Mark Jordan's Sex and Ethical Reasoning course, which is part of the Gen Ed uh, for the college. As you can imagine, talking about sex with this is a 160 person class um, can be a little bit complicated. And one of the things that class relies on heavily are consent practices. These are things where there are communities, these are consent communities that talk a lot about what does it mean to enact consent, 
And how can that be done in ways where that is understood by all the people in the space? Some of these practices can be things like checking in with your body. One of the section leaders asks every person to do the following. I'm going to ask you to do it with me. I know this feels a little camp counselor. I apologize, but I was a camp counselor. So we're just going to live that. Um, what I'd like you to do is to, let's see, the best way to do this would probably be you're going to have to angle your body a little bit away from the table. So maybe angle your chair so you're facing forward. And there's room. And then I'd like you to put out your left arm. Put out your right arm. You're going to cross them. Turn the palms towards one another. I know this is some real mental effort, but you can do it. Um, clasp together. Pull it up with you. I'm going to try not to hit my microphone. And simply hold it against your heart. Take your legs. Put them straight out. Cross, oh, let's see. Cross your left leg over your right. And then bend your knees so they come back towards you. And now press against. So the two halves of your body are pressing against one another and in towards you. The, the idea of this is to try to feel physically centered. Where is the center of your body? Are you physically present in this space? Hold this for just a minute. Sometimes this is paired with something like an affirmation. Thank you for being in this space. Thank you for being in your body. And then you can release the tension. Slowly unfurl. Shake it out a little if you need. But now think, if this is something that happens at the beginning of a class, what does that do for that classroom space? Imagine that this happens at the beginning of an econ class. Imagine that this happens at the beginning of a policy class. How does this shape the entire space of conversation of what is possible and what is valuable? Possibilities. <laughs> Ethical case studies. This, some of you I know are intimately familiar with. Um, we're presenting these as a way for students to analyze situations outside of their personal experience, but still with ethical reasoning. I think too often for many of our courses, ethical reasoning is something that is either considered outside of the standard content or an addition to the standard content rather than something that is woven throughout the curriculum. If we think ethical reasoning is at all important, then I would argue there needs to be a strong, definitive inclusion of ethics in the very work of the course. How many of you teach with case studies in any particular way? A couple folks, yes and no? Great. So for some disciplines, case studies aren't really how the teaching happens. In those instances, it can be useful to pull, for example, let's say you're working teaching history. In that space, pulling a particular historical example where there was a clear ethical deliberation, and asking students to think about it both in terms of history, historical methods, and in terms of ethical deliberation, and then asking, how do historical methods help us see what ethical deliberations are happening here, can be a useful way of pulling this towards the center of the course. If you want more on this, because it can be different in every discipline, I'm going to go ahead here and put my plug for SAPRA. <laughs> SAPRA does offer workshops and is regularly consulting with faculty members on how they can do this across a wide range of disciplines. So if this is something that is of interest to you, I highly recommend you reach out to Jess or the team, or Michael, any of the folks here. Also, some folks don't particularly appreciate when I tell them, oh, just introduce ethical case studies related to your specific content. Because they say, are you kidding me? That is a whole lot of work that you're asking me to do for a questionable impact. Not necessarily. This is the sort of thing that you also can ask students to create very simply. And they're often very invested in that process. And if you're tired of creating papers, it can be much more fun to have them create an ethical case study and have that as a section or have that as a formative assessment of their understanding of whatever content you're trying to convey. Fishful. This is really interesting and comes from justice organizing groups. The idea here 
is that you have the class organized in some way where there is a central group, usually smaller, and then people who are watching from the outside. The people who go in the fishbowl are people who feel similarly about an issue. So this works particularly well in like a Kennedy School setting where you've got a lot of contentious ideas and every class is a big debate, but sometimes that means you don't get very deep in what its particular position actually believes or holds. So isolating out the position, having the folks in the center, and having them discuss amongst themselves what that position is without interruption for a defined amount of time, then opening it up and allowing the audience to engage with the folks in the fishbowl reframes the, the terms of the debate, quite literally. You can then also have other folks jump in, as, so reconfigure the fishbowl with different positions. Um, there are a lot of variations. If you search online, you can find them. But I find this sort of thing of isolating individuals' positions, and better yet, when you ask people to come, so I saw this first done actually in a middle school setting, where they, this was in a highly religious school in Los Angeles, uh, where they asked students their opinions on abortion, or uh, the, I think that it was phrased as, what is your opinion of abortion's legality? Should it be legal or not? So it's a very cut and dried, and for some graders, a very strong issue. Um, but what quickly became evident was the folks who were either for or against when they were in the fishbowl were there for radically different reasons. But they had no knowledge of that because they didn't have any opportunity to speak with one another who were on the similar side without always attacking or rebutting the other side. The five minute flip, this is super fun. I really emphasize for those of you who are in philosophy or more abstract domains to consider this. This is a way of taking an invisible or marginalized perspective and entertaining it respectfully for a short period of time. Let's say you happen to be an example, or you happen to be at um, an elite college in the Northeast that may have a typical set of values <laughs> in a particular department that may not always allow for some perspectives to be heard. This is how you can bring them back in, by saying, we're going to have a thing called the five minute flip. If at any point you feel there is a perspective that we are not respectfully entertaining, you can say five minute flip and assuming we have time and space, say what perspective you think we are not entertaining at this moment. This also doesn't require the person who feels this way to immediately present it as their own and defend it. So you can bring that up. This can be the instructor's prerogative, this can be the students, this can be the TF. It can be something that is a marginalized position within the space. It can be something that you know for a fact no one in the space would actually believe or justify, or you think you know for a fact no one in the space. Um, and this then allows you the opportunity to actually have a discussion about it, treating it as a respect, maybe not as a respectful position, but treating the idea respectfully, which I think is critically important. Writing exercises. A lot of times writing is done entirely outside of class. I'm not sure when that change happened in the university setting, but I don't think that's necessary, particularly when you can use short writing as a way for people to think. Often what I see in lecture-oriented courses is that someone will lecture and then say any questions and then say have a good day. Maybe not that dramatic, but something along those lines. As opposed to 20 minutes in, putting a question on the board and saying I'd like you to take three minutes silently no laptops unless they're part of your accommodation, or however you want to phrase that. We can talk about accommodations for each of these also. Um, and I'd like you to take three minutes and respond in writing to whatever's on the board, and then <coughs> open it up to class questions, or and then ask people to partner with one another. Now this also, I mean, granted, now I'm talking about these as if they're just pedagogical tricks. They are. Um, but they're particularly helpful in hot moments because this is a way for you to not have the hot moment devour everything. If this is already a practice in your classroom, you can introduce it as, great, this sounds like a great moment for our reflective writing practice. Let's take a couple of minutes. Have people write out what you can say. I, I have done this ex exactly. This feels like a hot moment. Let's take three minutes and write, what about this is a hot moment and why? Even just that can allow people a bit of distance um, and a bit of critical insight. Oh, 
And I always like to stress with reflective writing, sometimes this can get really navel-gazing if you're not careful. So trying to think about, are you asking for it back regularly? Are you asking people to talk with others about their, what comes from their writing, in general maybe, if not specific? And then, are there ways to have collective response after individual writing? Silence. Silence, I love. Maybe this is just because I've been on too many retreats and I sound like I should be on late night radio. But pausing <laughs> can be great. And allowing people space to do that, again, as a regular practice, can reframe the dynamics of the course. I have things listed up here that I've heard from multiple teachers across campus. Some will do sketch breaks, which I think is brilliant and then have the students explain to someone next to them what their sketch represents for them, if anything, or how they came to create that. Physical movement, we already practiced that a little bit. Um, I'm not going to do that. I know you're going to think, wow, this guy is really woo-woo. Um, but I'm going to ask you now to simply, again, I think body position is important. So get in a place where you feel firmly rooted, both feet on the ground, Thinking about now a difficult moment in your class, or the one you were talking about in your case. Think about any tension that may be part of that. Take a deep breath in. And with your breath out, try to put that tension out of your body. So just breathe out. And then, this is something I love doing with students, turn to the person next to you, nod and smile, and then look back to the front. It's small things, it's silly things, it's bizarre things, it's cute things, it's hallmark things. They're also human things. The things that help us remember we're people in this space, we're not just minds. And in these interactions, we can affirm one another in ways that ultimately are useful for all of our development not just our cognitive development. Taking care of yourself. I didn't write this as self-care because I don't work in the beauty industry. <laughs> um, I think it's important for those of you who are teachers and for those of you who support teachers to think about your support community. Who is supporting you right now, if anyone? If the answer is no one, I would encourage you to really focus on that say that with no guile or malice as someone who at several points in my life have been like, is there anyone supporting me right now? I think it's really important to hold that. And especially if you in these hot moments are the person who feels targeted or personally affronted by whatever is happening in your classroom. It can be helpful to process your responses with colleagues, with friends, preferably ones you trust, as well as with reflection practice. Do you have a reflective practice in your teaching? When do you decompress? Is that part of your job? Or is that only something that happens in nightmares? <laughs> Having this be an intentional part of what you do, I would argue, can really reshape how you engage across the classroom, but particularly in difficult moments. And then finally, I think these are important so that you can return to the classroom with confidence and optimism. We'll speak about those values in a minute. Those are my eight. They're not only mine. I've stolen all of them. <laughs> and now we're going to practice responding. Um, in a moment, I'll ask you to flip over the page, not yet. And there will be three case studies. What I'd like you to do is fold up the page so that you can only see the first one. And I'd like you to remember to think about the types of responses, not just the intellectual physical, the emotional, the somatic, and how those relate to your response at each of these. You can go ahead and turn it over. Look only at the first one. Take a minute or two to read it and think about it, and then discuss with those at your table. And these you'll have more time to discuss than the first ones.
like most people have gotten towards finishing reading. Once you've finished reading and had a moment to process, go ahead and start talking at your table. Because how you react right there, if you take on that relationship with that, that's a tone for the rest of the How complex can it happen? And so then take a moment to share with each other if you're okay. Say it again. It would be difficult to say that, I think, with 
<laughs> so to just point out to the student who is sharing the story, you shared it with an individual, and part of the exercise is this would now be shared with the whole class. Are they comfortable? And, and do they want to? They can maybe repair themselves and say, well, maybe just say this, or, or you know, phrase it in a in a particular way that. Um, yeah, I still feel that I've shared a personal story, but that maybe. Because I have the same. You know, setting myself up to become vulnerable. I mean, how you would do that in the time you have, you know, in a classroom situation, I have no idea, but. All right, I'm going to ask us to finish that last sentence. Great. I heard some great commentary and some really good problem solving on the fly. Um, I also heard several people say, but I really need to know X in order to know how to move forward. I think that's always going to be the case. Um, for each of these, you're going to want to know more context. You're going to want to know, wait, but who exactly are these students? And what exactly is this course? And who am I? And what is the relationship that exists? And yes, you should want to know all of those things. Um, and that's part of the beauty and horror of these cases, that you get some of it, but not all of it. And yet, I am still asking you how you would respond, because I think this sort of practice helps us think in general such that when the specific arises, we're not completely rudderless. Moving on to number two. Please again, go ahead and read on your own, just the second one, and then you'll turn to your table to discuss how do you respond. I think first of all, the problem you can acknowledge, right. you know, yeah. uh, attending to individual interventions and you know system wide overhauls of both, you know, uh, in, in abstract terms, valid positions. You know, you can question a system as a whole, and you can ask yourself how you can improve it. Whether the particular in this case. suggestions, you know, have more so arguments time against time them or for them is a big question. There's nothing wrong with asking a question about the system. And thereby, you know, if this is one individual uh, who feels that they have to repeatedly state that position, maybe by acknowledging it, you know, you'd somehow make them less likely to us to press the same point again in a way that's not very constructive. I think it's, if you're able to do it in an analytical way, 
that looks like it's getting very, very fast. And so it means we're going to have that silent moment of quiet for people who are likely in the writing that it may be difficult, especially for those people who are feeling hurt. There's a way to have a minute to think and reflect. And then if there would be some way to share some of those reflections to kind of, if, you, if the piece is just like the class is divided, this group, group and then as opposed to seeing it maybe as a different way to yeah. talk to each other after. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I feel like the five-minute mm -hmm. right, five flip also seems to be reasonable. Yeah. 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 I'm trying to do things. Yeah. 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 Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 To let it be the polarized so that there's like one camp or another. And to do something after the writing to involve people that's now beyond Susan's side, or it's now not beyond, but just sort of like name the more two approaches, and then try to inhabit one approach versus Maybe even after I've done this, I think personally, they didn't seem to. Or, yeah, I suppose the right thing is to do is right now to be serious. If you're with students of color, you must feel this way. If you're with right? Why not? Students. I don't know if to be a And if we did it, to come back together for just a moment. So one more case, I believe. This one will be a multi-part case. But for the first round, we'll simply do it as we've done it before, OK? So read through, have your discussion, but then we'll introduce another element.
broader classroom issue as far as the noticing. I thought, or it's not clear to me that if it's just the broader discussion, there was one group of people who weren't talking, maybe this is one of those opportunities where like, these smaller groups of four people or two people, like, maybe you're finding that there are some voices that are not mm -hmm. in the conversation. Is there a way to shift the conversation to not just be in the whole group? It's not clear. Yeah. Um, in this case, what the classroom discussion was. Well, it says they increasingly engage more with one another in the school class. So we all sit together. And if so, can you, you know, mix up where people are seated? Yeah, first thing and then second thing. After having done that, then have them work in groups with people near them. Or, or you can have them uh, cut off and then get up and move. Yeah, doing something to change the kind of whole group dynamic. Yeah, I have mixed feelings about that. Yeah. Alice yeah. has put on the table yeah. an idea of bringing some of the don't do that. Don't do that. Don't do that. Oh, okay. Don't say, now we're talking about you know, your identity. You should go and tell us about it. Okay. All right. I didn't hear the don't do that. It's the um, tokenizing. Yeah, it's the, you know, you're from the Middle East, you should be able to tell us something about oil prices. Right. Um, so that's a, a joke I'll, uh, yeah. I quite like. Um, I wonder whether the student instructor and the students individually have said that others aren't as thoughtful as they're doing anything in the background. It's hard to know what that means and what inserted. Whether this instructor asked or could have asked more of all the questions yeah. to, to that to think about what does thoughtfulness look like with yeah. this course I'm around the set of ideas? Kind of what kind of, of, what kind of background do students right? need to so understand maybe, maybe what? Right. Actually to something quite different, which no. is something like you know, disrupt that, 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 that right. sometimes maybe make like a mix. Mix. When these classes, when this right, yes, they're not right. 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 yeah. 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 How they get together. Try to hopefully, you know, before the class where a particular group's identity is, is discussed. I mean, the question is: Are we, are we talking about the, the the case where you were too busy to think about it and prepare, and you have to rescue the situation? So, well, and, you, and could you turn, this is riskier, but it's really hard hard to to turn the classroom yeah. dynamic itself into a case in point? We now have a bit of complicating information. <laughs> what I'm going to ask you to do is to think of three different identities that the identity could be. Any three. And I'd like you to write them down individually. Three different identities that the identity could be. It's fine to continue thinking about that. Um, what I'm going to ask you to do now is then think about, as a group, share the identities that you've written, if, if you feel comfortable doing so. I'm trying to imagine if there's a case in which that would feel uncomfortable. I'm not sure if there is. If there is, I apologize. That's not my intent. Um, difficult moment. Difficult moment. <laughs> Just so call it out, name it, and try to work against it or to help it through. Um, and so share the identities and try to think about, are there any identities for which your response would change? Because 
Transgender people. Yeah. Yeah. I wrote that down. That our teachers said rather than you know, maybe <laughs> rather than you have a category <laughs> way of response for change. Race or gender. I see. I'm curious about that. So I put um, even LGBTQ, naming. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, African Americans or the sector and that's what we're interested in. Right. So a lot of differences. So are you thinking that if it were Think, simply thinking about the way I teach and the categories that come up there in terms of people who <laughs> show <laughs> behavior that you know, uh, might indicate that they're uh, having problems with the behavior of the majority. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, Results described. Yeah. So there's certainly people from a number of countries who very rarely get to more party to discussions. Well, that's a fact. And that's a social fact in that context. Um, and, 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 and you know, I could, not, I could see them fitting into that description. Not being personally, you know, outside reference. Not that yeah. in, I mean, it's in reality, in computer so science, we never discuss the more that I teach. Different, right. you know, that's fine. Like, strong, right. the same way as, you know, and 
you know, the point of view of uh, either such a religious or religious or religious or religious or does not make that presumption. She but we are. So do you, but do you think, yeah, and I, I was thinking, you know, about transgender as a category for the that isn't there? I mean, where, you know, therefore, your response might need to be adjusted to, to that, that fact. I don't know, the school in general has been very supportive, so very supportive. Yeah. Yeah. First of all, I don't know, you know, everyone's got the necessary awareness and training of the effects of people with transgender. So they can't be And how to deal with, you know, people who have got attitudes work against them. We're not talking about, like, All right. And if we could come back together, please. I'd love now to hear, as a bigger group, were there any moments where you all feel currently unresolved in your discussion of these? I see some nods. Would anyone be willing to share? Microphone is at the ready. <laughs> <laughs> If, if your group feels resolved, then perhaps this isn't necessarily something that at the group level is unresolved, but for you, you as your own self, is there anything that you're still questioning at all? It's also fine if no one is questioning anything, but I do want to have a space for if anyone's like, actually, I would like us to think about this. Are you talking about this case in particular? Any of the three. Any of them. several of the slides, something around do we press in harder or mm -hmm. do we move away from? Do we make the identity of that group and indeed the topic of that day's class um, a case in point? Do we do we try to name the dynamic happening? Either we instructors name it or get the students to somehow through some kind of small group discussions or some some or reflective writing leading to something to acknowledge in a sense, the proverbial elephant in the room, uh, or does that just make things worse? That's a great question. I think that came up in a couple of the groups. It's to what degree are you exceptionalizing people? Mm -hmm. To what degree are you asking people to be representative of an identity? Mm -hmm. To what degree are your questions with regard to tying the content to an identity or being given, as is often the case, content where an identity is included, what does that mean for the responsibility of the instructor and the responsibility of the students, if any? I think this also links back to that one of those original questions around what sorts of contracts exist in the learning space. 
Are you supposed to bring your whole self to the space all the time? What does that even mean? <laughs> but also, um, what, are the, what are the appropriate limits, if any, to what you bring into the pedagogical space? One thing I uh, was thinking about in this is, um, we've talked about the individual students and their responses and the instructor's responses, but I think students have been thinking a lot about ways in which they, um, when they're bystanders, how they can be allies and the different ways in which students are interacting in the space sometimes with their individual views, but then also that they're interacting, ways in which they're supporting others or, or thinking internally, should I be speaking out on behalf of? So there's that dynamic that happens in the classroom too. Yeah, thank you for raising that. One of the things each of these cases does is it really isolates the action to the singular decision maker of you. And one of the things that is rarely the case is that you are the arbiter of the decision making that will happen. Um, so I appreciate you calling that out for us. And towards your point about this way students interact with one another, thinking about how the things that we respond to or with don't need to be equal for all students. Are there groups of students that we should engage? Are there folks who are already organizing socially, politically, emotionally, in particular ways that we should attend to or not? And what are the ways that we can think about how students exist outside of the classroom to impact how they engage within the classroom, either with one another or with the course content? I think each of those can be really productive. Um, yeah, I have a, just a wondering. Um, sometimes maybe the teaching skill is very important. Uh, I just worry the, the first cases. So I'm wondering, maybe sometimes um, uh, the teaching skill is very important. But the first time when we meet the students and the teachers in our class is very will have a good have a. Um, have a very significant uh, influence on the whole study time. Yeah, for example, the keeper's case, um, if the student should just, uh, yeah, I, I talk with my um, my, my partner uh, about my uh, bad, bad experience, but the teacher just uh, around me, uh, and uh, maybe, um, uh, make a um, few minutes pause and then change and uh, uh, shift your uh, opinions about other things and don't uh, give a, give, didn't give a sentence or a word about my case. Uh, and I actually know you, you just hear that. Uh, so I may feel that maybe you also the teacher who will abuse me. Oh, that was yeah. too sad about that. So I just wondering how to balance the teaching skills and also take the students, um, the uh, students into consideration. Thank I think you. that's a really, really important consideration. How do we balance the need of the class with the need of the individual? And in this case, when the individual is revealing something that is that they've encountered, that is an experience of trauma whether it's theirs or someone else's, to recount that can be deeply meaningful for that person. So I think your sort of exhortation in your question that we consider that person and care for them. I would love if we thought more about what care looked like in pedagogical spaces, and I think that's something that we can do. But I think that requires a degree of social awareness that also necessitates an understanding of personal responsibility that is paired with communal responsibility. What are our responsibilities to one another? And how can we be explicit about that in our practice as teachers? So I love the thought you have there of, well, if they never come back and say anything, do they just not care about this experience that I've shared? I think that could be a very real response on the part of the student if they notice that you hear. And so highlighting that as an example of when students share things that are deeply meaningful to them, are we acknowledging them? In many ways, I think this leads to a larger consideration of these hot moments. I think the first step is acknowledgement. 
I think all of the things we've talked about is sort of assuming that we have acknowledged, but we do have to start there. And so thinking about how are we acknowledging it to ourselves, to the students, and to anyone else impacted is absolutely important for this. If we had more time, <laughs> we would have spent time going back to our tables to discuss your own experiences again in light of these cases. My hope is that you have friends old and new at the table that you can discuss this at other times if you'd like. Um, and I'd like instead to end simply with a thank you and open it up for questions, uh, if you have any broader questions about anything we've presented today. Um, but first, you know me and these little affirmations. If you could give a quick applause to the people at your table for bringing their thoughts to you. Thank you so much. Any thoughts or questions about anything that's been presented? We have, I think, unfortunately only like two minutes for questions, so I'm happy also to stay behind after if you'd like. Can I ask you to just start by asking a quick question on like hierarchy for these. So for me as a teacher, I have an order of operations of like least, most, you know, I guess least touch intervention to most, you know, hardest touch, I guess lightest touch touch to me. That's not the right way to think about it. But do you think about that in this same way pedagogically with difficult moments? I think that's a great question. I, I would hesitate to put these as each operating at a level because I think they can each, I see each of them as a scale. Um, so, for example, consent practices could be a very small thing, or it could be something that is actually a quite large ritual that happens every class that becomes deeply meaningful. So, um, in that way, no and yes, <laughs> in the sense that each one has a spectrum, but I absolutely agree that there are different levels at which these can impact the course. So, perhaps the easiest would be the intentional pause, right? Like, you could start with it being just a blip of, you know what, we're going to take a quick breath, all right, and let's dive back in. Or it can be, we're going to take 15 minutes to look at this work of art. It's a sculpture, we're gonna put it in the middle of the classroom. We are going to look at it with our eyes. We are going to move around it physically and we're going to spend 15 minutes in silence doing this. Like, as a response to whatever, you know. Um, so I think to that way, yeah, there's possibilities in each of them for scaling up or scaling down. Just a, uh on that five minute flip, um, if you could just give a little more detail, build it out a little bit. You talked about respectfully entertaining an invisible or marginalized perspective. What are some of the prompts or stepping stones for doing that? Yeah, so I think one part of that is simply naming it. So having someone say, I think there's a perspective that's missing here. And then as a, as a teacher, I would say, what is that perspective? Mm -hmm. Great. And I, this is usually where I'm bored, immediately writing on the board to get a, a point of reference for folks. And then saying, all right, I know that this is a flip exercise, so not everyone agrees. But in our most generous mind, what do we think the people doing this are motivated by? And what are they trying to do? So something like that. Um, or you can ask, what values are represented by this position? Or who embodies this position? And then what aspects of this person can you respect in their embodiment of this position? I saw this once, I, white nationalism came over, up over at this table. That often can be a really good rubric for something like this. Can you think of a group of people or a position who you know are viewed as folks who are not welcome in the space? And can you treat them as still humans worthy of dignity on the grounds of being human, for example. So trying to set up ways for the students to understand these are still people, and even if we vehemently disagree, we need to be able to think beyond simply vehemently disagreeing, the why, the what, the where, the how, mm -hmm. such that engagement can actually potentially happen and growth or progress, however we conceive it, could potentially happen. Does that answer your question? Yes. So, uh, I have a follow-up to Allison's question. So it sounds like, from the way you just described that, that your students might know what a flip is from the way you just responded to that. Do you explain at the beginning of the semester? Could you tell us more, please? Yeah, of course. Thank you. Um, so in general, when I'm, when I'm teaching, what I'll do is each time I introduce a new like, track, tactic, strategy, I won't just do it. I will start with, today we're going to do something slightly different. 
it is this. Here is how it works. Here is why we do it. And yeah, thank you. And so for some things, I'll do it on the first day of class. So like the affirmations, because I do them all the time. I'm like, we're going to talk about this right off the bat, because you need to know that affirmations are something that I do. And here is why I do them, because I think they are good for us as people in these ways. Um, but for other things, like the critical writing, that's generally not something like at the beginning of class I would tell everyone, but like when we use it, or if we use it in a different way, like the scaling we were talking about, if we scale it to a different degree, I'd say, and we're going to use it differently for these reasons. Um, yeah. Thank you. I think, I know that Andrew has to know, so I think we'll sorry. <laughs> go ahead and uh, wrap up, but let's give him another round of applause. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. And again, I, I think what I really like about this is that, kind of to Laura's last point, is that these are, you know, I like how you how you foregrounded this. These are proactive uh, strategies, and they're just some strategies, but these being incorporated not just in difficult moments, but in, as a part of your practice, so that when difficult moments arise, these are things you can pull in, and it's not like. Oh, we're doing a five-minute flip. Something terrible must have just happened, right? If they're part of your, your the culture of your, your classroom. So I think that's a really important point and a really, really useful uh, framework for, for approaching difficult moments. So thank you so much. Um, we are, again, not finished. There's uh, Monday. We have um, just across the hall in that beautiful room over there. Um, we will be on uh, uh, having two presentations, one by our, our final uh, ethics pedagogy fellow, Roni. Sadowski will be giving a presentation on embedded ethics, uh, more, more plainly uh, embedding ethics in whatever curricular uh, design you might be doing. So we've had some design talk, we've had arguing ethics, we've had difficult moments, we'll be kind of talking about the curricular side of how one might embed ethics into anything that they are teaching. Obviously all of these are, are in that same framework. And then the, the Harvard study on emergent trends in the learning and teaching of ethics, the surveys that our center has done over the last two years with hundreds of faculty and hundreds of students, and we'll be delivering some of that information um, during that, that final session on Monday. So we hope to see you then. Please take food before you leave, and thank you again.